A very warm welcome uh, to another episode of Fresh Thinking. Uh, for the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about the topic of data and in particular, uh, the importance for accuracy in your data. Uh, our panel will be discussing, amongst other things, why we believe it's important that your data is trustworthy. We're going to talk you through some of the common issues that we typically find when we look at or first look at a client's analytics account, which is quite interesting. And hopefully we can share some practical tips on how you can actually kind of fix some of those issues that we see. Uh, and later today, we're going to email out a link to uh, some exclusive early access to a new tool that we've developed here um, that will enable you to go away, uh, load in kind of your analytics data and start to perform some of the checks that we typically perform on a wider analytics audit. So if you so wish, uh, hopefully this evening you can start to validate your own data uh, after this session. Uh, but we'll get to that and uh, a little bit more on that later. Uh, I wanted to just to firstly start off by introducing myself and the other guests that we've got on the panel. Uh, so my name is uh, Dwight Thomas. I'm a business director here at Fresh Egg. So I work with a number of our clients. Uh, in previous roles, I was client service director at a WPP media agency and at an e-commerce agency. So unfortunately for me, I've seen firsthand what can happen when there are discrepancies in data. Uh, I'm also excited to be joined today by three expert Fresh Egg panellists. So I'll let them all wave and say hello. Uh, first of all, we've got Dina Alam, who is our Head of Conversion Services. Hello, I hope you enjoy the talk today. She's joining us from our New York Loft apartment. Uh, we have uh, Julian Erbslow, our Head of Analytics. Good afternoon. And last, but definitely not least, we have Graham Marsh, who is a senior web analyst at Fresh Egg, but also, more importantly, he is the creator of our new analytics troubleshooter tool. Hi, everyone. Cool. Uh, a final bit of housekeeping. Um, it's been awesome, actually. We've had so many questions uh, for the webinar pre-submitted, I think more than we've ever had. So we're going to start, we're going to answer some of these, hopefully, in a QA and a uh, at the end of the session for you. Uh, but if you, there is a Q&A function in Zoom that probably most of you know. So if you have got a question throughout it, then please do post it in the Q&A and I'll try and get the panel to answer as many as we can if we have time. And we'll hopefully wrap up by around four o'clock today. Um, so before we get into the tool and talk about some of those specific data issues, I thought it'd be good for us just to kick off. Um, if I asked the panelists to explain why they think it's important to have trustworthy data, and also just to explain a little bit to everybody on the call today, uh, how we go about validating it. So Jules, Graham. Can you yeah, I can start on that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that the reason why it's important to maintain it is that if you don't, it will deteriorate. Um, and that's just the nature of, of working in analytics. So your, your websites and your apps w will evolve, that they'll be changing over time. So it's important that your, your analytics setup um, evolves with that. Uh, and part of that is... Uh, obviously, doing regular checks to make sure that uh, sort of unexpected things haven't happened with your data. Um, but yeah, in terms of the consequences of this, this can, these can be really far-reaching across all sorts of uh, uh, disciplines within digital marketing. So for example, uh, it's very important to have uh, accurate page-level data uh, for your content strategy. And then uh, on, on the marketing performance side, uh, and you'll see some examples across all of these uh, when we get into the, the different topics that we're looking at. But you'll see, particularly for marketing, there are things about having accurate channel data and um, kind of making sure that you haven't got any issues with attribution as well um, so that your, your marketing performance can be analyzed uh, accurately. Uh, and then from conversion rate optimization point of view, Dina, do, do you want to jump in and just talk about your experiences there? Well, yeah, if you're doing any kind of CRO or any kind of optimization on your site, you're going to be using data to make business decisions about your user experience. So you need to have trust in your data and your data setup. 
and um you know all too often you know we hear oh well we can trust the test tool data and um, we've got more confidence in that um and you know some test tools have got um, better analytics within them than others but really you want um everything to align up as well as it can um across your system so that you can maximize on insights but also um compare apples with apples when you need to so yeah absolutely critical to have good data The bit I think that I'd like to hone in on here is, is, is the trust element. I think um, trust is really important and trust in your data uh, expands outside of your department across the whole organization. So um, the two go sort of hand in hand. If you, you can have really, really top quality data, but if nobody trusts it, it's almost, it's, it's almost useless. Whereas uh, the other way around, the data might not be of the greatest quality, but there's almost blind trust in it. Both, both scenarios can sort of, um, cause cause problems. I think a, a good analogy is um, uh, data is almost like your sat-nav. You trust your sat-nav most of the time. It tells you where to go, but it can also waste time if it sort of reroutes you um, the type of wrong direction. So, so quality and trust are two, two really important points here. Yeah. I think, yeah, the cultural side of it is really important. Once you, like Julian says, once you lose confidence or the organization loses confidence, that makes it really difficult for you if you're working, think, working in marketing or as an analyst, trying to get people on board to be more data-driven. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. And, and oftentimes those are cultural as well. Um, so the first thing to say is that this this data quality does fall short really often. Um, me and Julian can, can attest to it from, from the audits that we do. Um, and yeah, th this can be across all different types of businesses, small, medium, or large. Um, it, yeah, it, this is a common, common issue. And uh, some, some of the reasons that, that, that we find for this is uh, lack of planning. So <laughs> It's quite typical that analytics might not be part of the workflow for, for site changes. Um, oftentimes, changes are made and then analytics is kind of only the afterthought. Um, so, yeah, like we were saying before, when you make changes on the site, analytics can break. So, so that needs to be considered. And then also on the planning side, it's about planning what data you need um, and in what form. For, for later on when it comes to actually analyzing what you need to be able to analyze. Uh, in terms of ownership, uh, like with anything, if, if responsibility isn't clearly defined or if it's too widely distributed, then, then this can cause issues. Um, but other things we see in terms of ownership are potentially lack of experience uh, or expertise for the people that are, that are owning it. And then another issue potentially could be that um, the owners kind of don't want to take responsibility or don't want to admit to the data quality issues. It can be very awkward for them to uh, like take active steps to fixing something that's been their responsibility for a long time, um, it, especially if they need to sign off investment to be able to do that. Um, and then lastly, kind of tying it all together is, is the documentation. So this is kind of quite a, I guess, boring and fundamental thing, but it's really important um, that this is put in place so that uh, different stakeholders can understand and use the data, but also in terms of um, kind of the technical side and the maintenance, the people who are working on that need to be able to understand why data is collected in the way it is, uh, understand why the naming, what the naming conventions are, and sort of any reasons for any kind of intricacies within the uh, tracking setup. Yeah, I think we see that a lot where people don't um, have a record of what is actually set up. And I think what often gets missed is that it's a task in itself to um, get the data set up right and validated. Um, it needs some time and some resource applying to it. And it's quite often, as you said, in the kind of planning piece, um, something gets gets forgotten in the sort of web development area. Um, you kind of take the um, data piece with you and um, you know, all, the, all the setup of the tool itself in the first place it's not an onerous amount of time but I think it's a bit of a myth that you can put a tag on a site and then you're done um, definitely I think one bit of advice is allow time and resource to get it right as you would any system and 
on a continued basis. Yeah, thanks, Dina. Um, so on that, let's just talk about a couple of the ways that we ensure that data is accurate for our clients. Um, so the first thing kind of goes back to what I was saying about planning. We, we have a strategic approach when we start working with clients. So we'll do a full comprehensive audit of, of the setup, uh, fully documented with clear recommendations about how to fix it. Then we'll also work with you to understand your business, understand what your reporting requirements are and, and analysts, analytical requirements and translate those into technical requirements that then we can brief into your developers. We work with them to implement any code changes and also any, any changes that need to be made in, in Google Analytics or, or your tag management system. And then we also help you by um, outlining kind of the next steps to, to maintain that because even if you go through this whole process at the beginning when you're, when you're setting your GA up, you can't just set and forget it. You need to um, go back and be, you know, have continued investment in making sure that that's accurate. Which leads us on to the next slide, which is an example of a maintenance schedule that um, we use with our clients. Um, these are all custom depending on kind of how much traffic you get or how, how often changes are made on your site, but we'll set out um, kind of a regular schedule uh, to check across all the all these different areas of configuration, data quality, data protection, documentation and reporting. So that's kind of the, the upfront bit about, you know, why this is all important and why, um, why kind of why we're here. But now let's introduce the the tool that uh, Dwight mentioned, uh, the analytics troubleshooter. So I created, the, the way this started was I created a, a dashboard basically to make some of those maintenance tasks uh, a bit quicker. Um, and then I thought it would be a good, good idea to turn this into res a resource that, that other people could use to, to validate the trustworthiness of their data. So as Dwight said, all of you are going to um, receive this after the webinar. And if you're watching this later, you can, you can sign up for this on the website. Um, I'm just going to jump into it quickly and give a quick tour before we uh, go back into the deck. So, yeah, you'll receive a link to this Data Studio report. Uh, and you'll see that we've, we've got 10 different sections here where we're identifying common areas where your data can fall short. Uh, you've got an explanation here of, of what the issue is um, and, and what that can impact. We're going to talk a lot more later about uh, kind of the impacts and, and some of the solutions for these issues. Um, if you want more detail as well, you can click on any of the sections. You can click on this icon and that will take you through to this um, landing page where there's, where there's more details for you. But yeah, you can see, you can scroll down. This, this, this uh, by default pulls in data from uh, the Google Analytics demo account. The, the merchandise store uh, at the top you can click this and it will show you the uh, accounts that you have access to so I could change this to our fresh egg account and then it might take a little bit of time to load that's because we've got so much data coming into the um, to, to one page it can take a little bit of time to load but uh, once it does you'll have everything here um, that you need to be able to check in these 10 areas. So let's jump back into the deck. As I said, we're going to go through each of these areas in detail. I'm going to hand over to Julian now, who's going to get started with um, query parameters. You're on, yeah. I'm mute. Hello. <laughs> 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 scrambling for the button, sorry. Um, okay, so um, the first thing the tool looks at is query parameters, and it's probably worth pointing out that we're that those 10, 10 checks are, are in no particular order. Um, they're in an order that makes sense to us, but it's not necessarily because one is more important than the other. They're all, they're all important. 
Um, so first check is um, for query parameters uh, polluting the um, pages reports. So a query parameter is what you see um, in, in that red box. It's, uh, it's a question mark in the URL string followed by a lot of information. So this can be something as readable as here, or it can be a, can be a string of um, letters and numbers. Um, it could be um, uh, tracking parameters from Facebook or even from your PPC campaigns. All of that is a, is query string. Now, what query string does is it creates unique entries in Google Analytics for every every different version of the query string. So, as you can see in this in the screenshot here, the first ten or so entries in the pages report are actually all the same page. It's all the forward slash my account dot html page. So, if you now wanted to quickly understand the number of page views that that page has had, you would have to get the calculator out and do some maths. So this e explains why query parameters are a problem. What we try to do on the right-hand side is um, to simplify it a little bit to give you an idea of uh, scale of the issue. 1.3% um, is, is not a huge number, and we probably wouldn't lose sleep over it. But if, if, if those 14,000 affected page views are all the same page, then surely that, that's, um, that would be a problem. Um, probably worth pointing out that the ones, uh, the examples that you see here in the screen are examples where we probably would not strip the query parameters out or clean them up because actually they're telling us, as you can see, um, billing address, view order, view order detail. These are actually useful query parameters, which is why it's important to take a look at them before we start to decide what we, in, what we keep included or what we, what we exclude. Uh, I think in the next screenshot, we've got some examples of not um, not so good uh, query string. So the first three entries in this list are the home page. Um, if home page language selection is important for us, um, then, then, then we could keep it. But um, if you've got your Google Analytics set up um, in a sort of best practice way, you would have a backup account anyway where all of this is still included and you would remove these sort of query parameters from uh, from your reporting view to, um, to, to, to help with, um, with your content reporting. You could also pull, if you really need this data, you could pull this query parameter into a, a custom dimension, for example. So it'd still be available in your reporting, but your page level reporting would be clean. Um, so what, what, what are the problems? Um, um, the, the issue is really uh, accurate page level uh, uh, reporting. Um, there is a risk of people who are not aware of this um, making, making poor decisions based on this data and, and obviously the additional work to cleaning things up if you, if, if you do need to report on this, um, all of that needs fixing. So two ways you can do this really. One of them is um, you can go into the uh, view settings in Google Analytics. So in the settings, there's three columns, account, property, and view, the very far right one. Um, in, the, in those settings, there is a field where you can, um, with a comma separated list, add all of the query parameters that you want to exclude. From experience, this list is a little bit temperamental. For example, it's, it, it's um, case sensitive. So so sometimes um, in connection with other filters, um, this may not work as well as, as expected. Um, the sort of sledgehammer approach is to exclude all query string, which you can do either via, um, via, Google, uh, via filter in GA or, or, or a data collection in, in Tag Manager already. Um, what have we got next? Host names. So, um, Next thing we look at is the host name report. Host name is the actual domain of your site. And as you can see in the screenshot, um, we have got more than one subdomain. So we've got blog.freshegg, which is, which is a subdomain. Um, many of you might be familiar with this. Um, the host names report shows you a list of all of the host names that are sending data to your Google Analytics. And it's not unusual to have a whole list of host names in here which you don't actually want to have in your GA. So this is one of the first reports we always check. For example, the third entry um, and fourth entry in here are, um, are staging and UAT environments where maybe our developers are, um, are working. We don't want that data to, to mix with the data of real users because it dilutes, it dilutes, um, it dilutes the numbers 
uh, and potentially gives us false readings. I think my favorite, um, favorite story is uh, I audited a website that had been built by, um, by a, um, a small web agency. They had copy and pasted the website code to build a number of a, um, a websites, and they had copied and pasted the Google Analytics code with that um, website code every single time. So uh, when, when I looked at this report, I, I had traffic from about 15 different websites that were totally unrelated other than that they had been built by the same agency. Um, and all of this was running into this, into this Google Analytics account. Um, that was the most, most extreme um, sort of case. When we talk about uh, the fixes, um, similar again to, um, to, oh yeah, sorry, impact would be quite interesting as well. Um, there, host name filters are a good way to actually detect bot traffic as well, which has become a little bit more difficult in Google Analytics in, um, in recent times. So it's also an important report to check whether you're actually, not only whether you have host names in there that you don't want, but whether all of your subdomains are being tracked and, and, and everything is in one place. Um, the fix, again, is a, is a filter in Google Analytics, but instead of trying to create a long list of exclude filters. We usually create a single include hostname filter where we um, add a string of all of the host names that, that are legit and that we want to see in our data. Cool. Uh, okay, so the next one is self-referrals. So this is when you see in your referral reports your own website. Um, and this, this is definitely an indication of, of something broken. It's very often uh, cross-domain tracking issues. Um, it can also potentially be missing tracking. Uh, so if you've got certain pages that don't have tracking on at all. Uh, within the tool, you can see the list of all your referrals here. You can scroll down and see the, the percentage of sessions that they're making up. So if you see your own website high up here, um, that's an issue. You can also search for it using this bar on the, on the side to see exactly how many sessions if, it, if, it's not, if you can't find it uh, easily in, in the table. And then obviously you can see how this is trending. So it might be a recent issue that suddenly just cropped up or um, it might be on the slide. Um, yeah, we've just got a quick question in uh, just to check. Um, can you just confirm all this data that you're showing and uh, is from uh, Google Analytics? This is all Google Analytics, yeah. So the, the, the data studio uh, pulls in directly from whichever analytics broke up. Uh, property and view that you that you hook up to it. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, the impact of this, so your your channel performance data can, can be unreliable. Um, if 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 basically you're you're missing tracking or, or the sessions are breaking because of cross domain tracking issues. Um, the original source that actually drove the traffic and the conversion might not get uh, attributed that session and conversion. Um, obviously, if sessions are splitting somewhere where they shouldn't be, that's going to duplicate that session and you're going to have an inflated session mat metric. Um, and then in terms of analyzing the user journey as well, you, if, you're, if you're looking at how someone's um, how often they've come back to the site and what they've done within each session, you're going to have an inaccurate view of that because you're going to see multiple sessions where you should only be seeing one. Uh, and then in terms of the solution, yeah, it just depends on on what's causing it. So if it's cross-domain tracking issues, uh, you need to look into that and see and figure out exactly what it is. Um, that can be just misconfiguration on the data collection side or it could be that redirects are, are, are messing that up. And then, yeah, obviously, if it's missing tracking code, the simple fix is just to make sure that tracking code is added onto all of your pages. I've seen a similar issue where um, people have quite innocently put UTM tracking on links within a site rather than just using it for off-site campaigns. And I guess you just think, oh, it's become campaign tracking, but GA will read that differently. And so you've got UTM tracking on a campaign on your homepage. All of a sudden, that traffic to a landing uh, another page on your site is considered going off-site to one site rather than within your site. So, yeah, it's a, um, some, an, another way I've seen this happen. Yeah, it's, it's a good example, yeah. Um, it's quite common 
for people to put that on banners on their homepage, for example. Mm. And it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a massive no-no. You should, de- you should be using event tracking to track any sort of internal click. Uh, because what happens is as soon as GA sees that uh, somebody's visited a link that has UTM parameters on it, it immediately starts a new session. So, yeah, I've seen it before where you'll have people who are, have got loads of conversions or revenue attributed to banner homepage or something when they might have actually spent loads of money on paid search, for example, sending them there. But then in GA, that, that, the, the paid search campaign isn't getting the credit for that where yeah. it should. Cool. So the next there's one. A, there's a question on that one might be worth answering. No, actually it says, what about using your own um, parameter like ref equals banner, like a query string parameter? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that, that wouldn't cause any issues with... Uh, with tracking sessions or anything um but i would probably i I think it's best to do um do it by event tracking i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that jules Uh, i agree i was just thinking about it um using your own query string is um is is useful or you if 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 you have a good way of extracting that information and then and then acting on it whereas if you use if you stay within sort of google analytics data model and use the um uh, event tracking uh, capabilities of google analytics then you can attribute conversions to events in the user interface which is probably um a little bit more user friendly but um but yes martin um using your own query parameters um equally is is a is a possible solution i think okay. thank you um, all right, moving on to the next one. So you can track your internal site search if you have one on your website. Um, and the, sorry, I've skipped ahead there. Um, within the tool, what, what this table will do is on the left, it will pull in all of the search terms that are being tracked by that. Um, so if you have a, if you have a search feature on your site and you don't see anything in these reports, um, then there's an opportunity there to set this up. Um, on the right side, what that pulls in is any search terms that have capitalization in. So you can see the issue. If you look at the left side, that includes everything where we're getting duplicates, um, for the same things like bread is there in first and fourth. Uh, if you wanted to know what the ch- true uh, number of unique searches for that is, you'd have to um, like do some manual work yourself um, to to fix that. Um, yeah, so it's as simple as that, really, for this section of, of the tool. In in terms of the the impact, obviously, it's a big missed opportunity if, if you're not tracking it. Um, those duplicates will obviously can lead to misinterpretation and uh, unnecessary work, like I said. Um, in, in terms of the solution, obviously enable it if you don't have it. And then to fix that issue with the capitalization, it's quite simple as well. You just add a filter to your view, which lower cases the, the search term, and that, that will clean up that data for you. Um, site search for me is um, really um sort of good set of data to share with your wider team beyond marketing teams beyond digital teams um because obviously it's you know full of ideas like product content ideas or product ideas um faq or support content to stop people having to calling um go go on to phone lines to call you um because they're searching your site for that information or even new features for your user experience so um getting that information right is, is good but make sure you're reporting on it um or, or looking at it in general yeah i agree but it's very underutilized uh report in ga all those search terms were what people search on the fresh egg site yeah <laughs> is it probably worth quickly saying how you how you enable your site search tracking this is really simple it's um, when you go into the view settings in google analytics um, there is a field where you simply need to add the query parameters. So 
on your home, on your website, if you go into the site search, you, you search for something, you will see a query string or query parameter again in the URL saying keyword equals and then whatever you have searched for. So keyword is your search query parameter. You pop that into the settings and it will start tracking automatically. So you won't need a developer or anything to do this. Cool. All right. Sticking with you, Jules, for the next one. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll do this every time, probably. Um, miscategorized referral traffic. So we talked about referral traffic earlier as uh, we were looking for self-referrals. Um, referral traffic is a bucket, as we call it, or a channel where um, we want to see traffic from other websites to our website. Um, what we most frequently find in um, the referral channel, however, is also traffic that shouldn't really be here. So as you can see in this little GIF, um, one type of traffic we, we frequently find in here is um, traffic from search engines. So you can see yahoo.com is here quite often, Baidu, the um, Chinese, Chinese search engine. So all of these are search engines that, um, that Google Analytics doesn't automatically recognize as search, search engines. Um, there is a quick fix for it, and we'll show you in a minute. I think other types of traffic that you might find in here as well, you could Oops. see that briefly, um, is email, um, email traffic, so referrals from mail dot or, or um, uh, outlook.com. Um, yeah, that's the sort of thing you want to be looking out for. Yeah, just to add to that, when you're using the tool, I've, I've set it up to highlight some common search engines um, and anything with mail in it. But there, there are potentially other things in here that you, you should look out for as well that aren't highlighted. Um, and quite related to that is uh, uncategorized traffic. So in the top, um, uh, top chart that the, that the tool will give you, you see a list of all of your uh, default channels that are set up. Um, we uh, will show you uh, a bit later, I think, um, how you can actually uh, in impact or influence what traffic gets sorted into which one of these channels. But the one we want to, we're looking for here is the, the other channel. So um, Google will by default categorize traffic into one of these uh, existing channels and you can add new ones too. But if uh, traffic comes in where the um, uh, source and medium do not match any of these sort of um, uh, preloaded um, conditions, they end up in a bucket called other. Um, so what we generally do is we, we, we visit this, this um, other bucket quite regularly and then, and then amend the rules to make sure that anything that is in here usually is campaign tagged uh, traffic that has either been tagged incorrectly or tagged in a way that, that, that GA doesn't understand um, and, and we fix them. So the second table underneath you can see there is a, a, an excerpt of, of what, um, what is inside that other bucket and you can see that traffic that has a source and medium as not set um, is either poorly campaign tagged or probably um, a bot traffic, one of the two. So impact was the problem with both of these. Um, the right channels are not getting the credit for, for traffic as well as conversions. Um, we so it sort of makes it difficult to have a top level understanding of how much traffic we're getting from there. I mean, in the example there, there was probably 1.9% of total traffic that ended up in other. In reality, we've seen a lot more. Um, and then again, as with many of these things that we highlighted previously, one of the issues is that it's a lot more manual work to, to sort these things, which sometimes might mean extracting everything from Google Analytics into Excel, doing your, doing your calculations there. Um, you can save yourself all of that time by, by making sure this is set up, set up correctly. So solution, and I think we've got a couple of screenshots to, uh, to show you as well how, how and where we do this in a minute. Um, one of the first, first of all, um, the search engines. So there is a setting in the property settings in Google Analytics where you can search organic search sources uh, right here. So um, this is a screenshot from the, um, from the GA settings. Uh, you go in there and you, you add each individual search engine that you find in your referral list, as well as the query parameter for that. So it's a bit of a pain. And unfortunately, we've, we've been begging for, a, for an Excel upload uh, feature for a long, long time because we've got lists that are ready that we could just upload. But um, 
Yes, as far as I know, you still have to do this manually. Correct me if I'm wrong, Graham. Um, then we have um, the channel grouping. So um, in Google Analytics, um, you uh, again in the settings, you go into the channel groupings and you 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 redefine the rules of um, if this contains email, put it in the email bucket, and if this contains Facebook, put it into the social bucket. Um, we then again we can write filters to to rewrite mis, mis, um, miscategorized traffic. So um, sometimes, if um, for example, Facebook is being tagged with FB, uh, Facebook.com, Facebook capitalized maybe, etc. You can you, you can set up filters that rewrite all of these so that they're consistent and they fall into into the channel where you want them. Um, and then last but not least, and related to that, is campaign tagging best, best practices. Um, we sort of, yes, there is, um, we, have a, we have a tool that we put together for this that sort of um, highlights um, um, uh, issues with your campaign tagging, but also helps you as an organization to be consistent, because most important is that, that, that the tagging is sort of consistent um, across different campaigns and across different departments as well. Cool. So the next one is the hit limit. So um, a, a hit in Google Analytics is a data point. So that's mainly page views and events, although there are some more ob obscure ones as well. Um, and if you're a high traffic website, you might be approaching or exceeding the 10 million hit limit for free GA. Um, in this section, it just you've got quite simply a big scorecard that shows you um, what it was for the last 30 days, which is the time period that you're allowed 10 million in. And then you can see how that's trended over time as well. So it might be that you've just launched something new and you've put loads of event tracking on it and that's, that's made things skyrocket. Uh, in terms of the impact of this, so Google doesn't guarantee to process hits in excess of the limit. Um, although I, I, I don't think we've ever seen this, either of us, but um, I think you, they, they will warn you and, and try and um, get you to, to upgrade. Um, but probably the bigger one is that if, if you're high traffic, as we said, you're, you're likely to be suffering from sampling. So when, when you're trying to analyze uh, things in, in the UI of GA, um, those of you who know will recognize the little orange um, sampling shield at the top. Uh, and when you see that, uh, you know, it can potentially the accuracy of, of the data that you're looking at is, is kind of compromised. And it's a couple of relevant questions for that, Graham. We had on the sort of ones that were pre-submitted, one from Michelle, which was how does sampling work for the free version of Google Analytics, which you've just touched on, and also from Christy, who asked, does sampling really matter? Do you have a view on that? Yeah, so how it works, first of all, is it, when you're looking at standard reports in the UI, you, you, should, you shouldn't really see sampling. But as soon as you start altering them by filtering or adding segments, um, if, if the underlying data contains more than 500,000 sessions, then Google will start to sample. And the reason they do it is kind of a balance of speed versus accuracy. So they, they want the report to load in a, in a time that's quick enough, to, you know, for the user, but also to be accurate. Um, it, and does it matter? It really depends on how much it's sampled. So if you hover over the little orange shield that I mentioned, you can see what percentage of sessions it's using. And if that's high, like 80, 90%, then you could likely be pretty confident in it. But once it starts going down, you know, it's, it, it's going to be less and less accurate. And particularly if you're looking at um, kind of segments of data that are quite small, obviously small, like a, a, a percentage difference on a small number can potentially be um, quite, quite a different story. Um, so, yeah. In in terms of the solution, so you, you can reduce the complexity of your setup so that you're not sending in as many data points. Obviously, this isn't always um, a, a, a route that people want to go down or is very easy to swallow because, you know, you, 
you're tracking things because they're useful, especially if you've gone through the planning pro process. Um, but the other option is to, is to upgrade to Google Analytics 360. So the premium product for GA has vastly uh, bigger sampling limits um, for, you, that, for you to deal with. Yeah. Probably um, worth pointing out here, Graham, that we, that we also have sort of a middle, middle of the road solution for some of our clients where um, we help them extract Google from uh, data from Google Analytics uh, via, via data pipes automatically on a day by day basis, re aggregate them in, um, in BigQuery and do the calculations that they need there. Um, this works for some clients who are after a specific uh, set of data in a regular, on a regular basis, but it, it's, it's not a solution for, for all of the data and for full, full analysis because from the free GA, you cannot extract um, the, the raw data set. I think definitely look at the complexity of implementation. Um, I've seen some accounts where um, reaching hit limits because they're being used to track um, stuff in the UI like scroll depth. So every pixel, um, every few pixels on a scroll is sending a hit into GA. And it's just, maybe that works in a site that's um, got a small audience, but as it grows, obviously that's going to escalate. And maybe that data is useful, but maybe it was just useful once for a certain project or a launch of a, a site, etc. And you just think, oh, well, there is another way to get that data, a heat map tool, for example, um, and the £100 a month for something like a hot jar or maybe slightly more, I don't know, for, for other tools. Um, it's probably still less than having to upgrade analytics pack package so I think definitely look at your implementation yes you've you've said these metrics were useful once but if you're not using them or there's another way to get them there's um there's other cost options probably yeah definitely are examples where where you can reduce the complexity mm -hmm. legitimately yeah cool so moving on to the next one personally identify or information or PII uh, this is obviously a really big one from a data protection point of view. Um, it, it's against Google's terms of service to send in personal data into GA. Um, so you, you, you do risk uh, kind of loss of data there or warnings from them. Um, but it, more importantly, it, it, it's a GDPR breach. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something that is very urgent. And if you see anything in here, um, in, in this report in, in the tool, then uh, definitely jump on that. Um, yeah, as I said, there's the legal risks. Um, there's also the potential loss of data. Um, they, they can just delete your um, entire property if you're kind of repeated offender of this. Um, but also just jumping over to the second solution here. So there is an option to delete um, historical data that's affected by this, uh, but it's not very sophisticated. You, it's, it's like quite brute force. It, if, you're, if you're collecting PII, like in the previous example, in your page, then you can only delete the page level information for the affected period. It won't just delete the affected pages, if you see what I mean. It's all pages for that time period. Um, so yeah, that, that's an impact even after you fixed it. Uh, you can obviously back that up before you delete it uh, as a precaution. Um, but the, 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 the only real solution to this is to make sure that it's stopped at source. So in the previous example, you probably need to speak to your developers and, and get them to stop passing uh, names and email addresses into the URL. Cool. Uh, over to you, Julian. Yes, yeah, find the mute button this time. Um, so this is something that we also see quite regularly. As you, what you see here is a list of all your transaction IDs. Obviously, only relevant if if you're um, if you've got e-commerce tracking enabled. Um, this doesn't mean that you have to be an e-commerce type of website. I think um, most, if not all, of the charities that we work with use e-commerce tracking to track. Um, donations as well. And what you see here in this report is that a number of these transaction IDs have more than one transaction against them. Transaction IDs are unique and each of these should only have one. So what this tells you is that in some instances, a transaction is counted twice. 
So the best way for us to highlight the issue or the scale of the issue in, in the tool um, is highlighted in the little red square that you can see down there. So by comparing the grand total of transactions with um, the total number of entries in that report, so 3,171 and 3,145, those two, those two numbers should match. If the, if the top one is bigger, you've got, you've got a few transactions that have been double counted. Now, why are, we don't, probably don't have to go into too much detail about why double counting transactions is, is, is a problem. Um, obviously, um, you're over-reporting on revenue and transactions. Um, you're potentially misattributing conversions because the second time this, this, um, this transaction is counted, it probably comes from a different channel. Um, how can this happen? I think um, there is a number of ways. Um, for example, in, in the e-commerce space, we see that users quite often bookmark the thank you page um, because it contains um, delivery information or something, something similar. And they will then hit the bookmark, come back to that page the moment the thank you page is loaded again, um, our code fires and, um, and, and another transaction is sent, sent to GA. This is, this is sort of one of the scenarios that this can happen in. To fix that, you'll need your developer's help. And what they typically do is they set, sort of, they set a flag the first time the transaction code is fired, and then the, that code looks for that flag, whether it exists or not, and um, before it fires again. Um, so it, it's, it's a pretty straightforward fix for them, um, but you need to identify the issue first. Um, right, next one. Um, not set landing pages. I don't know if you've seen this before. If you go into your landing pages report, and you have a line, an entry in there with not set. Um, this means that for that particular session, you haven't got a landing page. Um, this can be a number. This can be caused by a number of things, um, and it's, it's usually a sign for something larger being wrong. So it, it, it's worth following up. I think one of the instances where this might happen legitimately is when um, a user has your 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 website open. Um, on a tab in the background, forget about it, 30 minutes um, of non-interaction and that session expires. In now, if an hour, two hours or a day later, they come back to that page and start interacting with it and that first interaction triggers an event, for example, we have a new session, but no landing page because the first hit of that session is, a, um, is, um, is an event. Paula, I saw your question coming in. Where do you find it? A uh, landing pages report is a standard report in the behavior section um, on the left-hand side in, um, in GA. So impact. Um, the cause of sessions breaking um, can be, uh, 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 sorry, this causes issues with channel attribution. Um, it, it causes problems with user, user journey analysis and, and it potentially inflates the number of your, of your sessions. So um, solutions, and let me quickly minimize all the faces there. <laughs> um, um, if it's due to misconfiguration, this needs fixing. Um, it can be caused by natural behavior, something like I, like I just, um, just explained. Or um, what you can also do is you can create a segment of these sessions um, with no page views and see if this is, this is potentially bot traffic. You're on mute. You're good. Oh, I've muted myself on my headphones. Sorry. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Julian. That that's it for the ten topics that are covered in in the analytics troubleshooter. Um, just a quick note, thing to note at the end that um, this is a, this is set up in a way to kind of automate certain checks and also in a way that all of you can use it. So it applies to all of your GA setups. But there are lots of other things um, as well that, that do need checking on a regular basis. Uh, I won't go through them because we're, we're short on time, but um, basically things that are custom to your setup, um, it, it would have been hard to get them in here, obviously, because everything's different for, for all of you. Um, but yeah, I think the, just a key thing to, to a key reminder is don't, don't use the analytics troubleshooter as um, your only source of um, 
your, your only kind of resource for, for maintaining the, the quality of your GA data. Make sure you're looking at these other things as well. Cool, thanks, Graham. So we've got about um, 10 minutes left. And um, as I mentioned, we will email you. I've been reliably informed about five o'clock today with a link to use the tool. So I look forward to sending that over. But um, while we've got you guys for 10 minutes, I thought it'd be good to sort of go through some of the questions that have popped in and gone through. So I've seen Sarah uh, Palmer's just popped a, a note in the chat, but also Troy emailed in uh, to ask, how regularly should you be reviewing your Google Analytics setup, stroke doing these checks to ensure the data is validated. Probably a bit of a tricky question, Graham, but it goes back to one of your earlier slides. Yeah, so yeah, I showed that schedule um, earlier. It, it really depends on your your setup, your website, and I guess how, how regularly things are changing there as well. Um, what we'll typically do is, is start with a template of, of checks uh, like the one that I showed you, and then like, after a few months, we get a feel for how often certain things need checking. Um, but there are definitely there are definitely some things that need to be checked on, on a monthly basis, even if your even if your website um, isn't isn't changing too much. And then yeah, it, if you can create tools like like the Data Studio dashboard that we're sharing with you to kind of automate some of that, then then all the better. Thanks, Graham. So this next one's in from Troy. Um, what skills and experience do I need my team to have to be uh, to uh, to be able to maintain my analytics framework and the integrity of my data? Uh, Jules, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, I think um, the most common challenge that we see with our clients is um, is not skill or experience, but it's time. Um, like every other part of your organization analytics needs investment and investment or time 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 is effectively money so i think um the sort of the, the the most important thing you can do is to assign ownership over the data quality to somebody and then and this is the, the second part is the really important part and then to recognize that ownership by giving them time and dedicated ring fence time to actually look after this um and fix it or maintain it. Um, I think when it comes to skills and experience, um, experience is great. Um, but I think what, what I find um, more useful is, uh, is curiosity and, um, and, and really a desire to, to know and understand and, and a certain level of resourcefulness because most problems and questions in Google Analytics have been asked and answered before on the internet and, 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 and skill to, to research, identify a trustworthy source and implement a fix um, following a set of instructions is, 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 um, is, is a great skill. Um, I think from a technical perspective, um, tracking setup can be reasonably technical. Um, the person that you assign this to don't need to be a developer. Um, but they, 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 they should be comfortable enough with code to open the console and, and understand whether or not a, a hit is fired to Google Analytics. And then also they just need to be confident to know what they don't know and say, right, this is when I need help from a developer um, rather than sort of trying to model along. I hope, hope that answers, answers the question. Yeah, do you know anything from your point of view on that one? Um, I agree. If your team are curious enough to get the insights they'll likely have the curiosity to get the setup right the data integrity right um and also to be insightful um in your team and to you know ask what else the data can can tell me um i think on the kind of um maintaining data setup and even setting up your data in the first place going back to that point about you know you're managing a task here and it's probably one of the most vital projects on your website um yeah it doesn't necessarily get treated so so um you know you might want to enhance um analyst resource with project managers to support uh, you know migration to a system etc so don't don't treat it lightly treat it like an important um web project and another ingredient i guess um to add um in terms of maintaining a great analytics framework but also great um 
um, share uh, data driven culture, I suppose, is the most important thing that is to um, is a surprising ingredient. I think that's an honest culture. Um, going back to the deck and I think Graham made the point about you know not everybody wants to <laughs> always fix their data and that could be just because they're too too frightened to share a change or too for, too, too frightened how it's going to look in year on year comparison and it's such a shame because you just think oh you get so much more from it if you can trust it and 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 work with it and develop it and evolve your data um so you you, you need a uh, a culture of honesty and transparency to um, to know that your 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 team can work work well with data. That's really good. Um, there's been a, a flurry of questions around direct travel, uh, direct traffic. Sorry, direct travel. Di I've got holidays on the mind. But um, basically, Rachel wanted to know that so much traffic seems to be listed as direct. Do you have any more tips to demystify where it came from? Lynn similarly says, how do you correct very high levels of direct traffic? Traffic, And Gabby asks, how can I understand direct traffic better? Um, seems like that's a bit of a hot topic. So I don't know if we can provide any help. Yeah, I suppose, first of all, just to explain what direct traffic is. So we saw the channel reports and how Google Analytics classifies um, all, all of the other channels. Direct is basically what's left over. And uh, it's more like uh, traffic without that Google Analytics doesn't know the source of. So this can be made up of lots of things. So the, the classic one is people typing in your uh, domain in, into the browser. But it can be that um, they bookmarked it as well. Um, it can be traffic from messenger apps. And, and all of those, are kind of, I, I guess you would say, are kind of truly direct. But there are sometimes issues that cause direct traffic when it shouldn't be. So uh, the biggest thing that you can do is make sure that you're tagging all of your campaign traffic with, with UTM parameters. Um, yeah, because you, you might be losing some of that in, into direct. Uh, make sure that you, Julian, Julian showed the, the resource that we've got that uh, tells you how to kind of organize that. It's important that they're properly formed as well because... If, if they're misformed, that can just get bucketed into direct. Um, and then, yeah, I would say in terms of identifying if there are any issues, look, look at your direct traffic and look at the landing pages. And if you see landing pages in there that just don't really make much sense to, to be in there, like nobody would ever bookmark it or arrive or, to, or type it into their, their browser, um, so stuff that's like really deep in the site, maybe that's getting lots of traffic and doesn't seem quite right. Um, yeah, just start digging into that, perhaps see if traffic for that um, page is spiking on a particular day. You might be able to correlate that with some sort of campaign activity. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Jules. Yeah, there's a few technical reasons that, that, um, that I've come across um, over the sort of last few months even. Um, one of them is redirects. I don't know if you mentioned that already. So um, when you're campaign tagging and you, you're putting a link out um, in, a, in, a, in a banner campaign, for example, and you include a trailing slash at the end of that URL before, before the UTM parameters, but maybe your landing page does not have that, that trailing slash, then as soon as the user hits the site, they automatically get a three, 301 redirect, which is, which is driven by your, by your site. And there is a good chance that in that little redirect, and um, those, those um, uh, tracking parameters are, are being removed. So redirects are, are, are quite, quite an important one. A, make sure that, that redirects on your site all carry a query string across. This is a quick chat with your developers. B, make sure that you test click every single um, uh, link that you generate and put out there and make sure that there is no redirects in there. Um, another one um, that I only recently came across is uh, the cookie bar. So, We've, um, we've, we've seen more and more cookie bars. Hopefully, we've all got one, and hopefully all of our tags adhere to, um, uh, to the rules. Um, the source of your traffic, especially when it's, it's UTM tagging, is only available on the first page view that comes to your site. Now, if the user accepts the cookie um, banner um, maybe two pages later, that information is no longer there, and that session will be counted as direct. So... What you can do about that is make, make sure that your user interacts with your cookie bar immediately by making it, making it big and prominent. Um, and then another third one, 
um, and this is not just you who I know is listening, um, is uh, internal HTTP links. So your website is HTTPS, but in the process of upgrading it, you didn't upgrade all of your internal links. This might be the links in your navigation or, or in the middle of your page. Now, if, there is an, if your website is HTTPS, which means secure, and you have a link to a non-secure version of your site, which then redirects to a secure version of your site, the moment that anybody moves from non-secure to secure, all of the information is stripped out, and again, you end up with a direct visit. Cool. Well, hopefully that's of some help to Rachel, Lynn, and Gabby. I think I think that's a definitely a good start point. We're I think we're we're officially one minute over, so I think it'd be a good time to kind of officially end. I wanted to thank everybody uh, that tuned in to today's session. I hope you found it useful uh, and informative. And a big thank you to Dina, Julian, Graham uh, for joining me as panelists. Thank you for um, having us. As promised, we'll be sending you all a link out to Graham's new tool so you can have a play around with it uh, and tell us what you think of it. Uh, and we'll send out recording and links to um, a couple of Google Analytics training resources and courses uh, that we're going to be putting on uh, next week. So um, if anybody wants to know any uh, more about what we offer in this space, then I'd be happy to um, get in touch with me and uh, we can follow up. Uh, and remember to keep an eye out on email and our social channels for the next webinar uh, later on in August. So thank you very much. Have a great afternoon and goodbye.